Praise be to God. I thank God for giving me this uh, privilege to stand before all of you this morning. Uh, I thank uh, the church also for giving me another opportunity to uh, preach from God's word. At this time, as always, I uh, thank the congregation for keeping myself and the family in your valuable prayers. We have experienced uh, God's goodness and mercies and his love, especially in the past few months. Um, and we thank you all for uh, showing us your love and remembering us in your valuable prayers. And at this time, I thank you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In connection to um, today's message, uh, I, I've titled it as To Set Our Eyes on God. And it is from a very familiar passage um, that I'm sure that we all read quite often and the story is well known to us. Please turn with me to Second Chronicles, the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20. And although there are about 37 verses, I will not be going verse by verse, but my intention today is just to focus on this chapter. It is a beautiful chapter. It is from the life of one of the very few but good kings in Judah, Jehoshaphat. And again, this, this might be very familiar to all of you, but I pray that this passage as we go through it, that it would be a reminder of who our God is, and how we deal with certain situations in our lives. In the past couple of months, even for me personally, many questions, many choices, many decisions, and as I was struggling through a lot of things that were going on in my mind, in my heart, it was this one chapter that God really moved my heart. And it, this passage has been strengthening me for quite some time. And before we get into the passage, I want to read one verse from Second Chronicles chapter 20. And this verse is the cornerstone of this chapter for me, for at least for this message and this application. Second Chronicles chapter 20 was 12. It is part of the prayer that Jehoshaphat makes. And verse 12, he writes like this, he prays like this. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. And it is this last part which has really moved and strengthened my heart. He says this, We do not know what to do. We do not know what to do. But, our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is the verse, dear brothers and sisters, which has really moved my heart and strengthened me this morning. And even for the last month, and I pray that as we go over this prayer of Jehoshaphat, that we will be encouraged and, and live our lives for the glory of God. So let us start by reading Chapter 20, verse 1 onwards, reads like this. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Meonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men and came to and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom and from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Let us turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven as we are seated in your presence. We continue to give thanks to you for the blessed time that you gave us to worship you. And to remember what you have done for us through your son. We are seated here before you, O Lord, to hear from your word. And as I stand, I pray, O Lord, that you would help me to be a pure channel of your grace. And as we read from your word, we are reminded that this is your word 
Please let it be a blessing to our lives, O Lord. Help me to preach faithfully. And I pray that those who hear, that hearts would be moved. And in the coming days that we would be doers of your word, O Lord. Thank you for the life of Jehoshaphat. Thank you for this chapter, O God. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles as a quick context. We don't know who explicitly wrote it, but tradition says that it was the prophet Ezra. And when was this book written? This book was written when the people of Judah and Benjamin are now returning from Babylon after exile. And this book is written for people who are settling down in Jerusalem and they're looking around and they're seeing broken walls. They're seeing destruction. They're thinking of a time long ago when Jerusalem was inhabited. There was joy, there was celebration. The temple of the Lord was at the center of all the good things that were happening in the land. And now, they're looking around and all they see is judgment, destruction. And the temple is being rebuilt. But they know that it's not going to be as glorious as it was. And this two books, First and Second Chronicles, was written to a people looking for hope. A people in the midst of judgment and destruction. And it was written to them to remind them of what happened before. To remind them of why these things happened to their forefathers and their fathers but also to remind them God is in control. There is a blessed future for those who call upon the name of the Lord. And so now in Second Chronicles we go through many kings and we see in chapter 17 and 18 we see a good king Asa and it is his son who was 35 years old when Asa died and now Jehoshaphat has ascended to the throne. And in chapter 20, this young man is faced with a great enemy. There is a great enemy. The Moabites and the Ammonites and some Mayanites have joined forces and now they have marched against Judah. And then in verse 2, we see men coming and telling Jehoshaphat, there's a great multitude coming. What are you going to do? And then we see the response of Jehoshaphat. There is a great army. There is great destruction that is coming his way. How can I face this problem? How can I face this challenge that is rising against me? Shall I turn to my armies? Shall I turn to Israel for their help? What should I do in this time of great difficulty? Verse 3. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid. We think, or I was thinking, godly men. You know, godly men in their leadership, in their power. How can they be afraid? You know, they are in the presence of God. Why should they be afraid? But even this verse was reminding me that even the strongest feel fear. Even people with wisdom have questions and doubts. Even people with strong faith sometimes falter. There are no perfect men. There are no perfect women. And Jehoshaphat is a great reminder of someone who has fallen before. And we'll get to that. But now he's learned his lesson. And now what is his response? He's afraid. He doesn't know what to do. Verse 3 reads like this. He set his face to seek Yahweh. He set his face to seek Yahweh and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And now we see this great picture of unity. There's a fast proclaimed, Come, brothers and sisters, 
There is a problem that we have to deal with. There is a great army that is coming up against us. We are afraid. But we are in this together. Let us pray together. Let us fast together. And Judah, verse 4, and Judah responds to the king's command. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek Yahweh. And Jehoshaphat, verse 5, stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And then verse 6 onwards he starts praying. I'm going to fast forward to verse 13. Chapter 20 verse 13, it writes like this. Meanwhile all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. No one stayed back home. They all had businesses. They all had farms. They all had work. They all had many things to do. They left it all. They left it all and they came together to pray. Was it just the leaders who came? Was it just Jehoshaphat who stood and prayed? Were it just, was it just the great teachers who came and prayed? It was Jehoshaphat. It was the great teachers. It was the priests. It was the women, their children, and even their young babies. They all came together. And they sought the Lord. And they fasted and they prayed. Now, was this just a result of a decision they made over one day? Did it just happen like this? A problem came and the people and the king knew exactly what to do. It wasn't just the result of one day. Let me take your attention to the context of how Jehoshaphat and the people responded in prayer. How was unity built? How did they all come together? How did they all come when the situation was a troublesome one? How did they all come together leaving everything behind? How was seeking the Lord the priority? Please turn with me to 2 Chronicles 17. And as we read this, there are three words that I'd like to leave with you. Very simple, but these three words have been a blessing to me as I was going through my day-to-day -day life. Read, pray, praise. Read, pray, and praise. Read, pray, and praise. Chapter 17. And we're going to read this very quickly. Chapter 17 was one on which Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and Ephraim that Asa his father had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Why? In verse 3, because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but he sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. Verse 6, his heart was courageous. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord and furthermore, he took the high places and the ashram out of Judah. In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, ben -Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to, to teach in the cities of Judah. And verse 9, it reads like this, And they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them, they went about through all the cities of Judah and taught amongst the people. 
Jehoshaphat, we are reminded, is a great king. He had great riches, great power, great honor. When we read from chapter 17, verse 10 onwards, it writes about the number of men he had. About 800,000 men as part of his army. By no means are we talking about a small man who had nothing. Oh, he had everything. Riches, power, honor. Great army to defend his city. But what was the focus of his life? In the earlier verses of chapter 17, it reads, He was courageous in the ways of the Lord. You have to show courage. When? Do we, do we show courage every day? Do we show courage when we wake up in the morning and go to work? We show courage when there is a difficult situation. We show courage when things are against us. We show courage when not everything is going according to plan. That's when we show courage. Everything in Judah, all the people were worshipping the Baals. They had the practices of idolatry. But he, according to the ways of his fathers, he said, No, I am going to be courageous. And I'm going to walk in the ways of my father David. And he made bold steps. Step number one was, I'm going to teach the people of the city the word of God. And so he picked people and he sent them. And all the cities of Judah were taught the word of God. They were taught to read from the word of God. So whatever we are reading in chapter 20, However, we are seeing them respond to a difficult situation. It was not overnight, but it was a consequence of reading God's word. How can I prepare myself to do the right thing, to say the right things, to make the right decisions when things are going difficult, when things are going hard in my life? Step number one is, I have to be reading God's word. I have to know more things about God and what He expects of me. How can I make the right decisions in life when I don't have time to read God's word? When I don't have time to study God's word? When I don't have time to come and study during Bible studies with the rest of God's people, when I have work and when I have families to take care of, when I have groceries to go buy, when I have things, other things to do in life. And I'm talking about me. If I can't make time for God, if I can't make time to read God's word and to study God's word with the rest of His people, how can I expect to enjoy God's blessings? Dear brothers and sisters, Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah did the right thing. Why? Because they read God's word and they knew God's promises. They knew that if they called upon the Lord, that if they set their face upon the Lord, Yahweh will answer. There is no doubt. He will not forsake his people. And so the application that we have to take, dear brothers and sisters, we have to find time to read word, God's word. We have to find time to come for a Bible study. We have to find time. I have to make that time. Because that is the priority. Because that is going to build me and my family. Because there is a difficult situation right around the corner. And when that situation comes, I need to know how to handle it. And it starts by reading God's word. With my family and with God's people. 
verse 10, chapter 17. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms and they made no war. There was a time of peace. And so Jehoshaphat, and we are thinking, now he's done what is right. It's all going to be peace from here on. I've, I've taken out the high places. I've educated the people. I have courageously kept God as my priority when others haven't. I've done everything that is right. I hope this peace goes on for the rest of my life. But we fast forward in chapter 18, Jehoshaphat makes a mistake. Great men make mistakes. All men make mistakes. He allied with King Ahab. And then a prophet comes and he tells Jehoshaphat, you've made the wrong choice, you've sided with those who don't follow God, but God is still with you. And so we can still expect peace, right? We're doing the right things. Why would problems come our way? Now we come into chapter 20. From nowhere. When there was peace in the land, when God had placed fear upon the surrounding nations, from nowhere it seems, three great armies have united themselves. Even when we do the right things, dear brothers and sisters, we will have challenges. We will have tribulation, suffering, affliction. We will have doubts. We will be afraid. But that's okay. Because a great man like Jehoshaphat was afraid. And there are going to be difficult situations. If we just got through one, believe me, there's another one waiting for us right around the corner. And that applies to our church, it applies to our families, and it applies to our own individual lives. But how do we deal with difficult situations? How do we deal with fear? When I'm afraid, when I'm doubtful, when I can't seem to make the right decision, we read God's word and we prepare our hearts. That's step number one. Step number two. We go back to Second Chronicles 20 and we read from 6 onwards. Now this is a beautiful prayer. I wonder how many of us pray like this. If we actually look at our prayers and if I look at my prayers, I know what is coming next. I've rehearsed my prayer night after night, day after day, I say the same things. And it's more so about me getting from God what I want rather than actually what Jehoshaphat did was setting my eyes on God and seeking Him. Please ask yourselves, do we pray like this? Do we call on God like this? This is what Jehoshaphat prays in verse 6 onwards. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdom of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, and they've lived in it and have built for you a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold the men of Ammon and Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O our God, will you not execute judgment on them? This great king of power, glory and honor. This is what he says in verse 12 in the latter part. 
we are powerless. 800,000 men this king had. He had Israel right next to him for an ally. He could have taken them on. But he stands before God and he says, We are powerless. I have nothing. All that I have is nothing. We are powerless. And then this great king, son of David, leader of Israel, the commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel, before the people says this, we don't know what to do. I've always, as, as I was <clears throat> meditating on this passage, and as I was mentioning, you know, when you think and you, you come across situations when you, you have to make choices, you have to make decisions, and you think, God, what is the right thing to do? You probably, or I probably look at leaders, be it in the church or be it outside, and you think they should have all the answers. Even the pressure of being a husband and father. I'm thinking to myself, I should have all the answers. I should be able to lead my family. I should be able to make the right decisions for my family. I should know what the right thing to do is. But sometimes, be the leaders of this church, be the leaders of our homes, be it mothers or wives, sometimes we don't have the answers. But the beauty of this chapter reminds us it's okay to not have the answer sometimes. It's okay not knowing what the best course of action is. You see, the people didn't come together. They didn't plan a strategy. They didn't come together and say, let's think about this and figure out the right way to do this. They came together and the king said, we don't know what to do. How honest are we in our prayers like this? God, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't have the right answers. I don't know what the right next step is. We don't know what to do. If the story ended there, we would not be here today. In this chapel. If the story ended there, there is no hope. If the prayer ended there, it would be a half-ended prayer. But Jehoshaphat doesn't end his prayer there. He says, we don't know what to do. God, we remember. In our prayers, we go before God and say, God, I remember what you have done. I remember what you did in the lives of the Israelites. I remember what you did in the word of God. I remember what you have done through all of history. I remember what you have done in the days of my fathers. I remember your promises, your covenant. How many of us pray like this? How many of us quote God's promises back to Him? How many of us remember? Jehoshaphat remembered, the people remembered because they kept reading the word of God. And in our prayers, we can be honest like Jehoshaphat. We can be honest before God. And we go before God by saying, God, we don't know what the right thing to do is. But, but, just like Jehoshaphat, we set our eyes on you. Yahweh, God of Israel, God of our fathers, God of David, Jehoshaphat says, will you not answer us? 
You told us when Solomon built this temple. Solomon prayed, God, when a great army comes against us and when your people call upon you, you must answer. We set our eyes on the God who hears and answers. A dear brother of mine, I was sharing my thoughts, my frustrations with him and I said, I've been praying and praying and praying but I seem to have no answer from God there's silence and then he said to me do you think God is not hearing your prayer do you think he does not care for you do you think that he does not hear the prayers of other people who are praying for the same things Brothers and sisters, our God is a God who hears us, who answers us, who is there with us. He is our God. And just like for Jehoshaphat, we too can pray. We set our eyes on you, O oh God. We don't know what to do. But we set our eyes on you. Why? Because we trust in who you are. We believe in your promises. We have faith in who you are. We have faith that you are a God who will never forsake. That is the reminder that we have from Jehoshaphat's prayer. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Verse 13, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and the children. We are gathered today not, as, not just as individuals or families, but as one. If we cannot come together in prayer, if we cannot spare time, if I cannot spare time, to come together to pray. And how can I expect God to lead me through difficult situations? How can I rely on others and be there for others if I don't have time for others? I can preach, love your neighbor as yourself. I can say all these things. But on a weekday in the evening, if I cannot make time, to come and pray with my brothers and my sisters, not just for my needs, but for the needs of this church, for the needs of their families, then I am not doing what is right. And so dear brothers and sisters, we are encouraged and yet convicted at the same time this morning the Lord is speaking from His Word and reminding us we must make time to read God's Word and study God's Word at our homes but also with the rest of the church. We must make time to call upon the name of the Lord as families but also as a church. Why else do we have Bible studies and prayer meetings. If not to come together and pray and read God's word. That when a difficult situation comes in the church, in our families, in our individual lives, we know what to do. And others can stand with us, fast with us, pray with us. This is the result of reading and praying. Read and pray. All Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and the children. And they all prayed. Verse 14. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite, the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, 
Listen all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you. What does he say? What does he say to King Jehoshaphat who is afraid? What does he say to the people who are gathered there and fasting and praying? They're all afraid and yet their eyes are on the Lord. And now the Spirit of God comes upon this prophet. And the words of Yahweh sound forth. And what does he say? What does he say? Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. This battle is not yours. This is Yahweh's battle. Tomorrow, and the word of God said, tomorrow go down against them. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. You don't need to fight in this battle, Jehoshaphat. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of Yahweh on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. When Jehoshaphat admitted that he is nothing, a great king, but before the king of kings, he is nothing. When the people came together, when the people prayed together, when the people fasted together, when there was a problem in their lives, when they did it together, Yahweh responded. And what did he say? People, Jehoshaphat, don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Because they were I am with you. This battle is not yours. Sometimes we just quickly read through this. And I want to emphasize on this. It's not that this battle was a surprise to the Lord. It's not that when they prayed, the Lord on his throne said, Oh, these people are coming. Let me see what to do. Our God is not surprised by the events of our lives and the problems of our lives, though we may be. But He knows. He knows there is a battle. He knows. But when the people set their eyes on Him, He said, There is a battle all right, but this is mine. I'm going to fight this. What do you have to do? Jehoshaphat, get up. You go make a stand. You go stand there and be firm and watch what Yahweh is going to do for you. Sometimes, now this command, this is particularly for Jehoshaphat in this context. Sometimes, dear brethren, we just need to stand. Sometimes all we need to do is take a step back and remind ourselves, God knows what I am going through. God knows what this church is going through. God knows what our families are going through. God knows what is going on in my life. He knows. I just have to stand and be firm. And if I do that, I will see what God is doing. For His glory. And in verse 17 in the end He says, You will see the salvation of Yahweh on your behalf. He is doing this for you. 
as we sit here, how many battles has God fought in our lives for us? How many times did God come in and save the day? How many times when we called upon Him, sometimes we waited, sometimes we didn't, but our God always answered. That is what we rely on going forward tomorrow. The one who answered us before will continue to answer us tomorrow. The one who fought our battles till yesterday will continue fighting our battles. Stand firm and see what God is going to do on your behalf. Read God's word. Make time to read God's word by ourselves and with the people of God. Pray. Pray like Jehoshaphat. Pray by yourselves and pray with the people of God. And finally, we come as we come to the end of our time, in verse 18, there is a response of Jehoshaphat. And I keep reminding myself, this is the king. This is the descendant of David. Great power, great riches, honor. This is the king. Verse 18. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. He bowed his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants fell down before the Lord. the king, the people, fallen down on the ground with their faces on the ground, on the dirty soil. Why? Because they were worshipping him and praising him. Acknowledging who he is and the mere fact that God responded to them. On the ground. When's the last time we were on our knees praying? When is the last time our faces touched the ground and praised the God who made the heavens and the earth? We have no time and praise God we have chairs. When is the last time I did that? Am I better than King Jehoshaphat? Am I higher in rank? If a king can stoop down, I can. If a king can acknowledge his shortcomings, I can. If a king can go before God and say, I don't know what to do, I can do the same. We expect our children, or I expect Eva, that as she grows up, if the coming of the Lord tarries, that in her difficult days, that she would call upon the Lord. Right? That's what we want for the next generation. That in their times of distress and joy, in whatever situation, that they will call upon the name of the Lord. That's what we, I, we all want. That's what I want from Eva. As I was reading this, the question came to my heart. If Eva doesn't see me praying, if Eva doesn't see me falling down before in God's presence, crying out to God and saying, God, I don't know what to do. If Eva sees me in all my weakness and all my shortcomings, in my moment of great despair that she sees me on my knees calling to God, isn't that the example she needs going forward? If I don't do it, how can I expect her to do it going forward? If I pretend that I have all the knowledge and all the answers to everything, how can I expect her to be humble going forward? Leaders, fathers, husbands, it's okay for us to show our shortcomings before our families and our churches. Because that is actually an encouragement to others saying that if... He he doesn't know the, quest, 
the answers to these questions. He doesn't, he's got many shortcomings. But one thing I know of this brother, one thing I know of my husband, one thing I know of my father, he falls down on his face and he seeks the Lord. One thing I know of my leaders, they do this. That's the model of Jehoshaphat. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to set our eyes on God. And He will hear. And He will answer. And they praised God. And as we end, I end with this last part because this is really interesting. Verse 20. And they rose early in the morning, went to the wilderness, and they went out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in his holy attire. And they went before the army. And they sang, Give thanks to the Lord for his love, his steadfast love endures forever. Please, brothers and sisters, picture this with me. Here is the army of Judah and Jerusalem gathered. Great men holding their spears and their shields and their swords. They are ready to see what God is going to do for them. They are standing in their uniforms. But wait a minute. There is a change in formation. Jehoshaphat is now saying, let the army take a step back. I am going to put a group of people in front of the army. Who are these people? This is the choir of Israel. It's as if Joseph and Jobin and the rest of today's choir stood before an army and said, Sing. The first question they're going to ask is, What am I doing here on the battlefield? My profession is to sing, not fight. An awkward place to be. But here is the choir of Israel standing before the army and they are singing on the battlefield. What are they singing? Give thanks to the Lord for His love, His steadfast love endures not just today or tomorrow, forevermore. Jehoshaphat says, I'm going to praise God. We are going to praise God on the battlefield, in front of the army. That's where they're going to praise Him. We often go to God and we say, God, I really need your help in doing this. I need you to do this for me. I need you to bless me at work, in my family, in my church. I need you to do all these 110 different things. But how often do we spend time in prayers praising God? in the battlefield, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of the suffering, I give thanks to you. Because your love to me endures forever. Dear brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of our time, when we read verse 22 onwards, they began to sing and praise and Yahweh started the ambush. He started the battle. He is fighting. They are praising. He is fighting the battle. They are praising. He is winning the victory. They are praising. That's the formula for me going forward. Read, pray, praise. That's the formula for you. That in your darkest times, in your times of doubt and pain and fear, oh, we are afraid. If there's anyone in this room who's not afraid, it'll be hard for me to trust you. We are afraid of so many different things. But we go before God in all honesty and we say, God, we don't know what to do. But what we will do is we will read your word. 
We will set our eyes on you. We will pray to you. And we will praise you. Yahweh will hear. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The Holy One of Israel. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Will he not hear our prayers? Will he not answer us? Will he not bless our church? Will he not bless our families? Will he not bless us? This is who we call upon. And we have many references in the New Testament. Paul saying, do not be anxious for anything, but go before him. Pray to him. Seek him. And peace that passeth all understanding will flow upon you to do what is right. I end by saying this verse again. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Can we say that together? As one congregation, one family, one people in God, can we say that loudly? Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. O great God in the heavens, ruler of all the nations and kingdoms of this world, you are the one who created the heavens and the earth. You are the God of Jehoshaphat. We worship you. We bless your holy name. God, as we sit in your presence, we thank you for your word. We thank you for reminding us to, to read your word, to meditate on it, to pray to you, to come before you with all our shortcomings and doubts and fears that we have access into your presence. That we can come and tell you, God, we do not know what to do. But we set our eyes on you. We thank you, God, that you've given us Gentiles the grace to come into your presence through your Son, the Lord Jesus. God, we pray for our church. We pray for our families. We pray for one and one, all of us individually, O Lord. We pray, O God, that you would give us grace to do what is right. That in the coming days that we would read your word together, that we would pray together, that we would fast together, that we would praise you together. God, we thank you that you are hearing us from your throne. And we thank you that you answer us in your own time. We thank you, O oh God, that we don't have to fight these battles. That you are with us. Help us to stand and see what you are doing, O oh God. God, we repent of all our shortcomings, all our failures, all our sins, all our weaknesses, all our doubts. We confess before you, O oh God, and we repent. And at this time, O oh Lord, we set our eyes to you. And we, and we pray that you would continue to strengthen us in our walk in the coming week. That we would maintain purity and sanctification. That we would grow in holiness. And that we would wait for your coming. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. And as we end our prayer, we pray, Come Lord Jesus, come soon and take us to be with you. Thank you for hearing us. We ask all this in Jesus' name.